Welcome back to Noble Green Wine School and we're starting our look at Spain today with Rioja. Uh, the Rioja region is in the north of Spain, uh, just south inland of Bilbao, um, and it's formed by the river Ebro, which is one of the longest rivers in Spain, and it carves out a long shallow bowl throughout the Rioja region, uh, which is lovely and sheltered, which makes it perfect for growing grapes. The area is further sheltered by the Sierra Cantabria to the northwest and the Sistema Ibérico range to the south, which uh, although in the west it has a more of an Atlantic influence and in the east it's more Mediterranean, this is tempered by these sheltering mountain ranges, which means that it's not as pronounced a maritime influence on the west as it would be in, say, Bordeaux to the north. Um, and in the east the Mediterranean influence is tempered, so it's not quite as hot as, say, Provence. So it's, Although there's a range of different growing areas and styles throughout the region, it's slightly more homogenous than th those two terms might imply. Rioja is divided into three main regions, uh, Rioja Alta to the west, which is the sort of more famous region, uh, Rioja Alavesa to the north, uh, which is in Basque country, and to the east there's Rioja Oriental, which used to be called Rioja Baja or Lower Rioja. Um, now this area is seeing a bit of a resurgence along with Alavesa, these are the two areas that are showing a bit more interest and lots of sort of new bodegas doing exciting things. Uh, so we'll compare that as we go along. Wine's been grown in this region for a long time. Even under Moorish rule, uh, it was tolerated right up to the 15th century. Um, after that, there's a few hundred years where winemaking sort of continued along in a more agricultural way than say the world-class area it is now. Um, and it wasn't until uh, the two problems that sort of hit the, wine, the wineries in France, powdery mildew, and then even worse, phylloxera, which decimated the vineyards across France first, particularly in Bordeaux. Uh, so the Bordeaux merchants, bearing in mind Bordeaux is, is as important as a port as it is a wine area, they had nothing to export. So they looked further south to Rioja, which is an area as yet unaffected by phylloxera, um, and they moved south literally just to have something to export to, them, to their existing markets. Uh, so they really invested and brought a huge amount of influence and winemaking technique to the area. One of the most important things they brought to the area was the use of oak barriques, uh, which was unknown at the time, um, and this is really what's defined the style of Bordeaux to this day. Um, I always think Rioja's got more in common with Burgundy than Bordeaux. They weren't looking to directly replace Bordeaux. They were just making a wine of exportable, good quality um, to fill the gap in their market. Um, and the, the local great Tempranillo really fitted the bill and really found its natural affinity with oak, for both French and American, as we'll see. After the Bordeaux region recovered, um, naturally enough, Rioja did stagnate for a few decades, um, particularly there was a lot of civil unrest in Spain uh, right up until the 60s and 70s, um, when there was a bit more investment in infrastructure in the area, opened up the area because it was quite isolated, and you started to see more investment, importantly more foreign investment coming in, uh, that really revitalised the vineyards um, and the old bodegas, and it, so there was a newfound interest, particularly in the 80s and 90s in the UK market in particular, we really found a taste for these wines and they were significantly better value in many cases than the Bordeaux that we've been drinking up until that point. And a lot of this investment and resurgence culminated in 1991 with its elevation from DO status, which all good quality wine regions had, to DOCA, um, which is the top quality in Spain. As I said, bearing in mind the different elevations, the different vineyard soils, you can't generalise too much. Rioja Alta tends to be a lot of clay limestone soils, which are really great for vine growing, a little bit more rainfall here as well, but you've got that sharper drainage from the limestone. Um, in Rioja Oriental to the east, it's much more alluvial soils because you're down in the sort of river valley here, so that there's a lot more fertility in the soils, but to counterbalance this, you've got less rainfall, which also helps restrict the yields a little bit to sort of balance out the quality level. The main grape variety here, as you probably know, is Tempranillo. Um, it makes some of the best wines. It's a very versatile grape, and as I've mentioned, it, it marries really well with oak. Uh, but also permitted and is often blended in is Garnacha or Grenache, uh, Graciano, Mazuela, which is also known as Carignan, and for the whites, Bayura, which is better known as Macabeo throughout the rest of Spain, uh, and Malvasia, which has died out a little bit, but we're starting to see a bit of a resurgence with this more traditional variety. Uh, Badeco, Chardonnay and Sauvignon are also permitted, but are not that often used. There's a little bit more Chardonnay coming through in some of the more modern white Riochas, but traditionalists still stick with Bayura. There's also, interestingly, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is permitted for Marcus de Riscal, um, and I think this is partly due, due to their sort of historical connections, Riscal being one of the first uh, to sort of marry up with the Bordeaux producers to make wine back in the, 18, the late 19th century. 
Um, but also I think there's a little bit of political arm twisting going on there as well, given they're quite a big producer and probably have a lot of control over the rules as they were being written. Vinification of the grapes is fairly straightforward. You know, standard maceration at um, a moderate temperature to extract the tannins and all the other things in the grapes for the wine. The important thing here, as I mentioned though, is this oak barrel maturation. And although it was the French that introduced it to the area, it was more commonly American oak that was used. Uh, American oak grows more quickly, therefore it's slightly cheaper. Um, and because of this, it's got a slightly looser grain texture. Um, French oak's quite tightly grained, so as the wine's maturing, particularly in a new barrel, you get a little bit of that vanilla, vanillin compound coming out. Vanillin is the same compound as in vanilla pods, which is why you can taste it in the finished wine. Uh, and in American oak, you get a little bit more of that coming through, a little bit more almost sort of coconutty flavours coming through. That's a bit of a giveaway um, of any Rioja that's been aged in American oak, particularly 100%. That little bit of coconut coming through is a bit of a giveaway if you're looking, looking to sort of identify that kind of thing. As well as imparting flavour, um, another main purpose for using the oak barrels or barriques is to allow a gradual ingress of oxygen. Now you've got a big volume of wine with this gradual ingress of oxygen coming in and what this helps do is to mature the wine in a way that it simply wouldn't mature in bottle. It keeps a lot of its lovely fruitiness and freshness but it also rounds the wine out, softens the tannins and it makes Rioja ready to drink on release. Uh, it's, part of the, it's part of the way in which they think about and the way they make wine unlike Bordeaux which is released on Primeau when it's usually far too young, Rioja's generally the other way around. They've done all the work in the barrel, they've done all the maturation and ageing and it's ready to go in theory when it's released for sale. Another thing said about oak barrels is this, they're simply not used for anything that's not top quality fruit um, and to make top quality wine because an oak barrel uh, at the cheapest is about six, seven hundred pounds and for the French barrels even more. They're, they're very expensive beautifully made pieces of equipment um, and th there's no point using them on cheap wine that's just destined for uh, a carafe in a, in a cafe. In Rioja there's four class main classifications. There's Hoven, which is not often seen, it's for young wine with no oak ageing. Most of this is actually consumed domestically in Spain. It's not really thought worthwhile exporting it in any great amount. We've really got a taste for the other styles. There's Criantha, uh, which is, has to spend a minimum of one year in wood and another year maturing for release, either in wood or in bottle. Uh, Reserva, which is a minimum of a year in oak and then a minimum of two years before release. And the third is Gran Reserva, which is a minimum of two years in oak and three years prior to release. But in practice, as you probably see from the, the vintages on the shelf in our shop and many others, they're released with much more age than this. These are just the minimums. Any quality producer with good quality fruit is going to age their wines for significantly longer before they're ready to go. And it, as I said, this all leads into the fact that they only release the wine when they think it's ready to drink. Um, not to say that they can't age further, but Rioja, it's all about that maturation. For whites, um, the traditional oak-aged, rich, buttery, slightly oxidative style of white Rioja um, fell out of favour in, in, in favour of, of lighter, fruitier styles. And this is mainly due to temperature controlled fermentation being brought in. So these rich oxidative wines that were aged in barrel um, slightly fell out of favour. There's a bit of a resurgence, but you find even when the wines are oak aged and they are slightly oxidative, there's still a freshness there that aren't in these the slightly more old fashioned white Riochas. Um, it's a bit of a hybrid in that sense between the old and the new with, with a lot of them. Our, our first white today does exemplify that for me. Um, this is barrel fermented and it's then further aged in French and American oak. And you would think from that, that it's going to be a sort of rich buttery yellow and have lots of butterscotch and um, depth of colour that you find from those really strongly barrel fermented Californian Chardonnays or Australian Chardonnays you might have seen back in the 80s but this it's got a lightness of colour to it so although it's been both barrel fermented and aged in oak it's by no means overly done for me it's quite well judged you've got that lovely light fruitiness coming through from the Vibra. Um, lovely lemon and blossom character, but you're also getting that lovely little toastiness on the back and it's similar on the palate. Lovely crispness, lovely dryness, that lovely lemon citrus fruit coming through, but a little bit of peachiness as well and that's partly from the grape but also it marries really well with the oak, it's really well integrated. You don't taste oak on it, it's not really drying in the mouth. There's a little bit there from the oak tannins but it's a really well balanced wine. Um, this would be absolutely beautiful with roast chicken. It's a classic, 
uh, with poultry, pheasants. Really, really beautiful wine, really well judged. Rioja has many of the problems we've seen in areas, I'm specifically thinking of Burgundy here, where inheritance means that vineyards get divided and subdivided by subsequent generations of families, to the extent that some, some vineyard holdings are just a few strips of vines, little patches here and there, and that's where the bodegas really work, and the cooperatives to a certain extent. The cooperatives account for about 50% of production in Rioja, usually not at the quality end, but some of them are good. Um, but the bodegas sort of buy in a lot of these grapes from these smaller producers to make a consistent style, a bit like we saw in, in, in Burgundy, again, reflecting back to that area. Uh, the cooperatives and the bodegas do make some really good wines, um, but a few houses are starting to produce wines from their own vineyards, which I think is, is we're starting to see a bit of a change in Rioja in that sense. This next wine we've got is a bit like that. It's a very modern style, they've very much gone against the grain in Rioja, as you can see from the label, they're, they're not going in this traditional route. This is clearly um, named in honour of Guns and Roses, and they're very much going down that style of, of breaking the rules. Um, it's 30-year-old vines, so that, that there's no lack of concentration here, but it's only had three months in oak, um, so it doesn't qualify for any of the quality levels, and they haven't even gone for Rioja on the label. They've eschewed most of the rules and just labelled it Wine and Roses, so it's very much their wine, although it is produced in Rioja, it's not on the label. Uh, it's clearly very youthful fruit on here. Um, this is two years old, so it's had very little time in oak and in bottle. Not at all what you'd expect from Rioja, but it does have that tempranillo fruitiness, that lovely brambly fruit. This has a lovely, charming fruitiness to it, but it does have a little depth there as well. There's a lot of graininess to the fruit, which you don't get from the oak, so it's still quite young, but it would work really well with tapas charcuterie, chorizo, all those lovely sort of strong flavours, but it is still a lighter wine than a more classic Rioja would be. And it's interesting to see something a little bit different coming from this region. So coming on to the third wine today, we're going back to the heart of what Rioja is. Although I mentioned Crianza, Reserva, Grand Reserva, for me, Reserva is where it's at. I think it's got the right balance of oak ageing, oak influence, depending on what proportions of new and old oak they've used, because don't forget, even though that stipulated the amount of time it has to spend in oak. There's no stipulation as to whether it has to be French or American, new or old oak. Those decisions are left down to the winemaker. So this is from Rioja Alavesa, an old family winery. It's now owned by CVNE, more commonly known as Cunet. Uh, this is predominantly Tempranillo, but it's got about 10% Graciano, which is a bit of a high proportion. And for me, it gives the wine a little bit of a freshness as well. Um, and it's also aged in American and French oak. This is a wine also I would recommend giving a little bit of time, although it's released mature. Um, I think it does need a little time to open up as well. So you've got that lovely marriage of that brambly fruit and that lovely creamy vanilla from the oak. The oak's not overdone here, I suspect it's not all new oak. Um, I think it's 60% American, 40% uh, French. And I think what I mentioned earlier about the coconut, I didn't really get it on the nose, but you do get it coming through on the palate a little bit, that lovely slightly savoury sweetness of the coconut, um, which is a bit of a giveaway of American oak. Um, one of the classic matches for this wine is lamb, and I was lucky enough to be picking grapes at Rioja Alta um, when they used the vine prunings to char grill um, some lamb chops, and it, it, with Rioja Alta uh, it was one of the best matches I've ever had. Um, it helps being out, out of doors with lots of good friends and sunshine, but it was one of those moments that really defined this wine for me. And, and what it really works with. So overall, th there's still a lot of tradition in Rioja, but I think, and I think the traditional wines are fantastic. They've got a worldwide reputation for a reason. They're great wines, but I think we're starting to see more interesting things coming out as well. I think there's room for both. One doesn't have to take over from the other. I think seeing more regional identity and a whole wave of new winemakers, because there's, I think there's 10 times more bodegas now than there, wasn't, there were in the 80s. So this emerging pattern I think we're going to see some really interesting things and I hope you enjoy exploring it. And we'll see you again next time for the next part of Spain. Thank you.